O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as, as at Meribah, as on the day at Manasseh, Manasseh in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Amen. Amen. So today uh, I'll, be, I'll be going over uh, Psalm 95 and speaking on the topic of worship uh, from this text. Uh, for those of you who might know, uh, there was a global worship conference being held at our church the past week. And um, I had the opportunity with some of the teachers to be able to attend it. Um, and, you know, worship conference and all these great speakers and worship leaders coming and, and sharing their thoughts on worship and teaching the people. It's a great time together. But in the midst of it, I had one of the worst times. Why? Because in a worship conference, I want to be able to worship and sing. But yet, my voice was not fully recovered. I could not sing. And it's so frustrating just sitting there. Yeah, everything that I was listening to from the people was very nice. But it was kind of frustrating not to be able to sing. You know, and, and so I want you guys to think about that. As you come into the presence of God, having the opportunity to worship, right? Small things like not having your voice completely, um, you know, that's such, such a big thing. I hope you guys don't take your voices for granted and be able to really, when you do have the opportunity, when you do have full voices, you know, last week we talked a lot about using your words wisely and being able to encourage each other. Instead of using all your voice and efforts and in, in doing those things to really be able to worship God with our mouth, with our lips, with our hearts. Amen? And so I hope that really becomes our prayer. And so today I want to be able to go over this text and I had the opportunity to be able to meditate upon it all week. And just, um, I want to share what the psalmist is really encouraging his people to do in terms of worship. What kind of attitudes, what kind of hearts do we need to go into the presence of God as we worship God? Okay, um, so in this world, you know, the sermon title is called Worry to Worship, you know. I want us to come in the presence of God with all our hearts just as we are, but at the same time be transformed eventually that we can turn our worries of the world and the things that we're dealing with into ultimate worship that God may be pleased with us, okay. And so as I look around the world, um, there are a lot of people who are constantly under a lot of pressure, right, a lot of stress. How many of you feel like you guys are... A, under a lot of pressure and stress from school, from friends, from parents, and what have you. Okay, so the rest of you guys are at, at complete peace. I can just see it in your faces like, oh, my life is so great. I don't have a single problem with my family members, with my mom yelling in my face. Oh, I just love that. It's just her expression of her love for me and, oh, music to my, I mean, come on. If we really think about it, we are under a lot of stress, a lot of pressures, and constantly bombarded with these things that we're faced with every day, right? And so um, some of the things that we worry all the time about are about our futures. Have you ever thought about your future? What am I supposed to do with my future? What does God want to do through me with my future? Or what about schools that you will attend, about colleges, some of you freshmen, about high schools that you guys will attend? And then from there, you know, going back to the future about the jobs, people that you will marry and have a family and what, where you will live and all these things are always kind of constantly be thinking about it. What about family members? Are you worried about family members in your relationship with your siblings, with your mom, with your dad, with your cousins, with your grandparents, whomever, right? I mean, we are bombarded all over in this world and because of all of these things building up upon us, it becomes kind of like a stress, right? And we're always constantly amongst these thoughts and things that are really lingering upon our hearts, right? And so um, for Christians, the good thing is in today's text, it kind of gives us instructions on how to deal with these types of pressures and stresses when they come at us, right? It's not as you, soon as you become a Christian, 
you won't have any of these problems anymore and they will completely go away. I'm not here to say that. So if you're expecting me to say that to you, um, please get that out of your minds right now. You, you know, the, what the psalmist right here is wanting to encourage is the proper instructions that we need to take when we are in the midst of these things, of stress, of, of pressures of the world. How do we really deal with it so that we can really honor God? So how can we turn the worries of life into worshiping God? And that is our goal, right? Life is all about worship, okay? It's so hard for us to come to church at times and worship joyfully, isn't it? Right? I don't even have to say, I wish I can just take a picture of your, your faces right now. As I'm standing up here, how all of you guys look. You guys look with so much energy and so much joyfulness. No? You guys are still looking at me like I'm crazy, right? I mean, you guys look completely dead, right? It's so hard for us to, see, this is a testament to all the things that we are dealing with in our everyday lives, in the things of the world. When we have joy in our everyday lives, in the Lord, we should be able to come into the presence of God and be able to be joyful in the songs that we sing. It's not like, oh, this song again, or oh, this person I'm sitting next to again, or, oh, you know, be complaining about these things and Joy should just resonate from our hearts and upon the presence of God, right? And so the psalmist here today wants us to, wants to explain that on seeing how we can really be able to have a joyful encounter with God, a proper perspective of worship. And so what I want to do today is just take it verse by verse and be able to kind of explain what the psalmist is really talking about here, right? So the first two verses, what we read is, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. It says, let's come together before the presence of God and let's make a joyful noise. Joyful noise. How important does the writer really think of that aspect? Well, I mentioned last time that any time where you see any phrases or words that is repeatedly um, said over and over in the Bible, it's kind of, they're trying to stress something saying, hey, look out for this. This is something of importance, right? And so if you look at verse 2, um, it says, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So in verse 1, he talks about let's come together in the presence of God. Let's make a joyful noise to the Lord. And then verse 2, again, be, be able to give thanksgiving in the presence of God by how? Making a joyful noise to the Lord. Making a joyful noise to the Lord. How many of you guys are sporting fans? Sports fans. Okay, how many of you guys are like boy band fans? I know ninth grade girls, you guys are like crazy over them, right? Maybe some of the boys too, right? Um, whatever the case, you know, I'm not here to judge. Whatever floats your boat, um, whatever you cheer for, we have this tendency where we become a fan of something. And I think sporting events are such funny and weird thing to just observe. I mean, isn't it? Like people gather together and they just watch this sporting event and they start screaming, start yelling, start getting mad if their team is losing, right? And they get really excited when they're winning and they start high-fiving and hugging people they don't know they're sitting next to if they're in a good spirit. And just watching grown men do this is kind of really funny, right? Just observing. I remember a time, I don't know if you guys might not know, um, in 2002, kind of dating myself here, I know some of you were like one years old, <laughs> in 2002, there was this major event that happened in Seoul, Korea, in Korea in general, in South Korea. We hosted the World Cup, right? How many of you guys remember that? How many of you guys were not aware of that? How many of you guys don't know what a World Cup is? <laughs> okay, it's a world soccer tournament that was held in Korea and in Japan. And I remember 2002, I was... I was a bit older than you guys, just a little bit, and um, enjoying my time growing up in New York. And I remember specifically when Korea was playing Spain. Do you guys remember that game? Anyone remember? I know the teachers might remember. Um, so there was a game where Korea was going up to like the final four, and they were facing Spain. It was a very important game. And the score was tied, and they go into a penalty shootout. And until the very last moment, it was penalty shots going back and forth. And the moment when the Korean player stepped up and he scored the goal and we won, people started going crazy. We, me and a couple of my friends, we went to a restaurant. It was like during the daytime. It was probably nighttime in Korea. And 
we were just going, we painted our faces, we wore these shirts that says be the reds and we have no idea what that means even to this day, but we wore it proud. We went out into the streets, we got the Korean flag out and we got into our cars. We were hanging out on the side of our cars like monkeys and we're honking the horn to the beat of, you know the beat that everyone does to the cheer, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to do it here, but uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. So we started going crazy, right? And when, when they won, we started just high-fiving, slapping each other and, and beating each other and, like, high-fiving all these neighborhood, I just see older men and, older, like, people we didn't know. And we were just in a celebratory mood. We we're very joyous, right? And we were just making all kinds of, voice, like, noises, and we were losing our voices, and we were going all crazy, I remember that moment when, when I was reading this, that came to my mind, making a joyful noise. It's funny how in sporting events or when we go to a, a concert of a band that you enjoy to listen to, right? You start going like, like, I never knew like girls can be like dolphins where their voices reach this level and they can break glass, I, I promise, right? It's so high pitch and you guys go so crazy. But what happens when you come into the presence of God? When it's time to worship, when the writer says, in the presence of God, make a joyful noise to the Lord. When was the last time you can say that you made a joyful noise to God? It's so hard for me to get a response out of you just standing up here, asking you a question. You guys are too cool, too lazy to say an answer or raise your hand. But when you guys are out these doors, I know you guys are monsters, right? Getting out of your shell, going all crazy. Right? The, the writer here says, Remember what God has done for you, how much he really loves you, right? And because of this, our natural response in worship shouldn't be where we just stand still and look in the screen and look at Harry Sam and his face and look around and try to listen to what other people are saying or try to make sure that you don't sound foolish or hit a wrong note or so concerned about yourself. When you come into the presence of God, true worship comes from when you're making a joyful noise to the Lord, Amen. Like, I had a friend who I grew up with, with, with the church together, and he no longer went to church. And so during my college days, we met up, and I, we had this conversation. I was like, <clears throat> what really happened? How come you stopped going to church? And he says, it's so funny to me. When I enter into worship service, I see these people looking so uncomfortable. Everyone just standing around, some people just sitting in the back have their hands in their pockets. You know, some people in the front, the band is going all wild, playing their hearts out, and yet people are just, you know, too lazy to clap, and they're just standing there looking like zombies, like wondering, why am I here? And he didn't understand the concept if there's a God who really loves them, who saved them by sending Jesus Christ upon the cross to die for them, why aren't these people excited? Why aren't they, these people thankful in response? Why is it that these people, after recognizing what God has done for them, and yet they come to just fill the spaces every Sunday and are so non-alive? Non you know, a non-Christian coming into a church and they look around amongst the believers who we believe that God is the one who loves us and he, he sent his only son to die for us upon the cross. And yet, we act like this in the presence of God. How shameful would that be? What do you think God is looking at? I mean, we have this concept and wrong idea when it comes to worship. We think that we're doing God a favor, right? Don't we? I mean, we say, God, I gave you my Sunday morning times from this time to this time, and so you owe me a favor. God, I'm singing this song loud for you. Remember that for me, right? But does God really need us to come and, and do these things for him that without it that he can't function? No. But this is what he fully delights in. He created us for the purpose of worship. And he's longing for his people to come together corporately to sing our praises to him in adoration, in reverence to who God is, the ultimate God he is, right? And as the Bible says to make a joyful noise to the Lord. But yet it's so even hard for us to open our lips to just sing a song. Now think about that. Can you honestly say that you give your best in terms of worship to the God Almighty that he is? Have you been doing that? Or if you haven't, do you think about it in the, in the concept of how can I really then further grow in my worship to the Lord and give my genuine heart of worship? Not thinking about who's next to me or what they might hear or how I might sound, right? 
we make worship to be about more about us than about God. And we lose this focus. And so the writer continues and says, gives the reasons why we should worship this God. Right? Verses 3 through 5. Okay? For the Lord is great God and a great king above all gods. And his hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, and he, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, um, yeah, so three through five, it kind of explains the reasons. It's talking about how God created all things. He's in control of all things, right? He created the seas. He created the land. He created all things for, for it says, for he made it, right? And so because of this, for us to come into his presence and be able to worship this God, right? We never really think about the magnitude of this God that we serve, Thinking about how in Genesis he spoke and everything was created. He's in control of the universe. And we, we can't even begin to understand. Well, maybe some of you have tried to you know, figure out astrology and are into really sciences and things. But even still, we can never fully understand the magnitude of the universe. We can't even understand this world, this earth in itself. But thinking about how God is the creator of this world, everything in it, he made it, right? And the universe. And this is the type of God that we serve. What an awesome God. And it says, he's above all the other gods. King above all the other gods with the lowercase g. In the sense, saying he's above all things of the world. The things that we like to worship. The things that we like to go after, right? The health, the wealth, the money, the love, the happiness, Right? The Bible says he's above, he's a king above all these things, and yet we fail to recognize that. Here's the thing. God created all of us to be worshipers. Amen? That's what he purposely made us to be. So it's either you're worshiping God himself or you're worshiping someone else or something else. Okay? Naturally, we are worshipers. And so if you're not focused on worshiping God, then you, you have to really check your heart and check yourself to see what is it that I'm really worshiping. Am I worshiping my school, my, my accolades, my future, my parents for, their, for them to accept me and, and be approving of me? Is that my ultimate worship of life? Or do I really consider God as my ultimate worship? And I really pour out, not just when we come corporately in the church setting, but in my everyday life, right? We've been talking about the book of Romans a lot in the past couple of sermons of Romans chapter 12, how the writer Paul is encouraging us to live our lives as a spiritual act of worship. Everything that you're doing, every moment, everything that you say is your act of worship. Worship does not, are not only confined in these walls, in the presence, in the church, but worship happens in every setting, in every situation. And so don't think, when I say worship, don't think of worship just in this place. But as you go out, are you still thinking about the Lord? Are you still thinking about wanting to make a joyful noise to God, to please God by the things that you say to other people? Do you really want to honor God and please God? By the way you act towards other people, do you really see that God is pleased with your actions? And that is our spiritual act of worship. And so the writer says, we, are, we ought to live in this way because of who he is, right? There's no other need to say anything. A lot of times we come to worship, we, won't, we pray. Why? Because we want something. We need something from God. When was the last time you just enter into the presence of God and say, God, I worship you because you're God, period. There's nothing, nothing needed to be said. I worship you because you created me, because you love me, because you're God. I, I want to worship you. And I hope we get to the point where we, our relationship with God begins to really grow and be able to see God for who he is the ultimate almighty God who is in control of all things. And, you know, like the writer here, the book of Psalm is like poetry. Verse 4, right? In his hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. Right? To the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, God is in control of all things. Right? But we come to God and we begin to say, God, I have this issue, I have this problem that's so overbearing in my life and so hard for me to live and to continue to go on. And we seem to be, make our problems so big. And yet we forget that God says, I have everything in my hands. I have the whole world. You know that song, he's got the whole world in his hands? And we sing that in like children's, um, you know, um, service and things like that. But that song is so theologically correct in a way where 
he, he does have everything in his hands. And the verses talk about he's got the sun and the moon and the stars. And, and verses go on and on talking about everything. How God is in control of everything in his hands. Now, I'm not here to say to minimize what you're going through, the issues and the problems that you're going through right now are, are, are worthless. I'm not saying that. I'm sure it's such a difficult thing. But we have to see the bigger picture of things that we worship a God that has everything under his hands in control. And so he looks at our problems that seems to be so magnified, so big in our lives. And we say, God, I don't know what to do with my life. Can you possibly help me? Of course he can because he's got the whole world upon his hands. Right? And so God wants us to come to him. And, and as it continues, the writer moves on to the next section, verse 6 and 7. Now he's, he's talking about God as the intimacy of God. The intimate, intimacy of God, right? God is not just the God who is out there just taking care of the universe, making sure everything is running properly and things like that, and he's never to be seen. But he comes to us so closely to our hearts. Verse 6 and 7, let me read it. Follow along. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. The writer explains that God is our maker. God is the one who, who took the time to put every bone in your body and every aspect of how everything functions. Right? When you become sick, you begin to really wonder, man, how does body function? You go to the hospital, they're like, you need to do this, you need to do that. I'm like, say what? I don't even know what that is. Like, how do you even know that that's broken and that's not working correctly? Are you sure? Right? I always, you know, I can't really trust doctors. Um, but um, see, the thing is, like, we know that God is our maker. And you think about that. And you say, man, God created me. God created each and every one. He didn't say, I'm making humans and he just made all of you at once. No. He took the time to create each and every one of you in the different characteristics that you guys have, different personalities that you guys have, right? He's our true maker. And the maker in the Hebrew, in the sense, the writer is playing uh, uh, words with the words saying that he's like a potter shaping his clay. Is that, that's what he does for us, right? He creates us and he shapes us to mold us into the likeness of Christ each moment. Verse 7, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Now, you begin to see a lot of pronouns here. Do you guys know what pronouns are? Did you guys learn that? You guys are seniors, right? You should know. Um, so if you look at verse 6, it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. So the, the writer here is not talking about a God that is so far and distant, but he's saying God is right here. He is our God, and we worship this Lord. It becomes so intimate and so personal. Kind of going back, um, just thinking about the body, and I looked some stuff up, right? And for you, you know, future bio majors, you guys, I guess, know this. Um, God put about 100,000 uh, little cells together to create an eyeball. Did you guys know that? There's 100,000 100, cells in each eyeball, and we have two. So we have 200,000 cells that is made up for our eyeballs. That's kind of crazy. 60,000 miles of arteries in our bodies that makes the blood flow. Do you guys know this fact? Okay, well, now you guys are learning. Right? Um, that's kind of crazy, like 60,000 miles of arteries. That's disgusting. But that's within our bodies that makes us function and how the blood is circulating and pumping and flowing for us to have life. On our tongues, there are 9,000 taste buds. I feel like I have six, right? But, but, but you know, there's 9,000 different taste buds. That's crazy. How can we experience all of them, right? Um, and so God, you know, we, so we understand to have different tastes, something to be bitter, something to be sweet, something to be sour, different things. God has placed 220 bones together for us to make a frame, um, some of us tend to have thicker bones than others. That's not a problem. But we have all these bones that God put together, 220, right? And on top of that, he, he placed 600 muscles. Some of us has, have bustle. But uh, anyway, he has 600 muscles that put together on top of that, right? Okay, so that we can go out and play, and play basketball, play video games, whatever. Do active things. Just thinking about every little intricate detail that God this God of the universe thinks of each and every one of you so personally, right? 
I mean, that, that should re really require us to really worship God, doesn't it? That not just worshiping God with, oh, yeah, God, I'll give you this time, and I'll, I'll sing a few lines for you, and I'll clap, and, and ah, when is this thing over? But like the writer says, to make a joyful noise, right? To really make a joyful, let's try that. Let, let's practice that right now, okay? For this second one, on the count of three, I want you guys to really shout and make a joyful noise, okay? Let, let's see how, I mean, if we can't do this here, we'll never be able to do it. So ready? One, two, three. So if I am, let's say I'm not, I'm not God, but I'm in the place of God and I just spent all this time with all the muscle groups and everything that I just described, making each and every one of you, and all my creation is shouting all these joyful noise, it's kind of sad. Come on, we can do better than that, right? We do better at concerts, at sporting events. We go all out, we go crazy. But why can't we do that in the presence of God? Let's try that one more time. One, two, three. And so I hope our worship service really becomes like some kind of a jungle, <laughs> like, like really shouting shouts of joy to the Lord, making a joyful noise to the Lord to the point where you experience God's love and you just cannot contain it within your heart, that you just want to just express it to the Lord. And if you really want to go the further extent, you know, you, you read through the book of, in the Old Testament and see how King David, he worshiped. I don't encourage that if you read the details, but to the point where he's not ashamed, he's being able to dance around in the presence of God, not caring what other people might think, right? I mean, are you really ashamed of who God is? Or can you freely say, God, I really do love you, and I'm willing to put everything on the line for you, my reputation, it doesn't really matter, right? You're the one who really matters in my life, and so I desire to really worship you, 